Okay, so the title of my sermon is Some Will Never Believe. Some People Will Never Believe. So um, I constantly get emails and, and questions from people all the time, and I'm sure you've encountered this in your own lives, is when you're trying to get somebody saved, or you really want somebody to get saved, and you really want somebody to believe, it could be a family member, it could be a brother, or a sister, a friend, a child. Well, not, not often a child, but if, you're, if you get saved later in your life and your son or daughter is a little bit older and you're trying to get them saved and sometimes it, it you know it's very difficult um, some people will say to me hey you know what what verse should I be using because they keep asking this question or they when I say this they rebut or they rebuttal me with this and you know what's the perfect verse to give them that will change them and make them believe in, in Jesus and um, I just wanted to do a sermon like this so you can have a clear idea of what God wants you to do in the situation of giving the gospel and getting people saved. Because I've told you guys and I've showed you guys how to give the gospel, but I haven't really talked about you know what happens if somebody doesn't receive it rightly. Because so, sometimes you'll be reading the Gospels and you'll see people, people listening to Jesus and you just see like, oh, 5,000 believed or 3,000 believed and Jesus spoke to this person and then the whole city believed. But not a lot of people talk about the fact that there's a lot of people that don't believe. And it's good to have this understanding because sometimes you're just beating a dead horse. Sometimes you're trying to get somebody saved and they're just not ever going to believe. And I want you to have the right idea, a biblical idea, of why this happens, what's going on, what you should do about it. You know, do you need to search for a better verse? Do you need to have a better gospel presentation? Um, it, it, should you wait longer and just stay? Let's just see what the Bible says. And we'll start in Jeremiah 17. It says in verse 9, as the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? And then let's go to Gen Genesis 8. We're going to read both of these verses at the same time. Genesis 8. So Jeremiah 17 is saying that the heart is deceitful, it's desperately wicked, and who can know it? It means like, how can you predict it? How are you going to be able to understand and predict these things? And then look at Genesis 8, verse 21. It says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. So notice, God is saying that people from their youth up are naturally wicked. And we know this because when Adam and Eve sinned, we all received the curse of death. Like we're all, like Adam and Eve didn't have to die physically or spiritually. They could have just lived forever. But because they sinned, they had to die. And that is something that's been passed down to us. You don't inherit their sin. You don't like, you know, if your dad sins a sin and then you're born, you're not born with that sin. Nobody's born with sin. What God is saying is that when people are born, the, a, man, a man's heart, a person's heart, its tendency is to do evil. Its, its tendency is to do wickedly. And that's because Satan is always tempting us with evil. And obviously we're not God, we're not Jesus, we're not going to always make the right decisions. But God and, and the prophets in the Bible acknowledge that man and child, and as the Bible says, is evil from his youth. If you saw a kid, like put, put a kid out in like... Um, out for adoption, right? You just leave him on his own. No good parents, just kind of fending for himself. Do you think that kid, nine times out of ten, is going to be a nice, caring... No, he's going to be what he has to... You know, he, he's going to be what he becomes. And if you can picture that in your head, you'll understand why, without proper guidance, everybody on earth would be evil. It's just the, tend it's the easier thing to do. It's the more lustful thing to do. It gives you more instant gratification. So it's important to understand that before we start talking about, you know, it can ev will everybody in the world that we give the gospel to get saved? No, because you have to understand that a man's heart and a man's desire, and when I say man, I mean men, women, children, a, a person's heart is naturally going to go the route that it wants to go. 
Not the route that it needs to go or that is morally right or that it's spiritually. It's going to go the, har the route that it wants to go. The, it, whatever imagination it conjures up, that's where it's going to desire to go. So you may say, oh, I, I have the best gospel presentation. I could get anybody saved. Well, some people don't want to be saved. Some people don't care. They don't ever think about it. When I got, first got saved, I would ask my friends, hey, do you, do you guys ever even think about what happens to you? This was before I broke ties with you know, most, most people I know. And I, I would say, hey, do you guys know or even think about what happens to you when you die? And literally, without, a, with, without fail, every single one of them said the same exact thing. I've never thought about it. Not once. Because all people care about is whatever's going on in that day. Whatever they're dealing with that moment. Let's go to Matthew 13. <clears throat> and a good, a good thing to do during the sermon while I'm giving you these verses is to picture somebody that maybe you've tried giving the gospel to. Like you've tried to just tell them about Jesus. Just, you know, explain to them that Jesus died for your sins and, you know, he wants you to be saved. And that person who just upright just rejects it or they say something totally different you know oh no jesus didn't do that or oh no you have to do this this and this in order to get sick. just they will not believe whatever you say keep that person in mind when you read these verses because the verses will start to make sense because you'll have an idea you, you already have a picture and now you'll have an understanding matthew 13 verse 14 it says and in them is fulfilled the, prophes the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So what is this saying? It's saying you can present the clearest picture of the gospel and they can see it and they could understand it. You could even do a miracle in front of them. But seeing, they won't see it. And hearing your gospel presentation, they won't really hear it. So you can tell somebody, you know, a friend, a relative, somebody you love, and, and it's just explain to them, hey, Jesus died for you. If you believe in him, you'll go to heaven. You know, he'll, he'll save you from hell and protect. And they're hearing every word you say. They're processing it. They're understanding, you know, okay, he's talking about hell, and I, I, I understand that he's speaking about Jesus. But they're not actually hearing you. They don't, as the Bible says, their heart has waxed gross. Anybody who denies the gospel is an enemy of God. And they're just not going to listen. There's a certain, and, and that's not everybody, obviously. We've all gone soul winning and see, seen many, many people get saved. We've seen our family members get saved. We've seen, you know, children and, and you know, elderly and adults and all alike who believe and, and actually hear what we're saying. They understand. But there are certain people that will listen to everything you have to say, see everything you're showing them, and just will never, ever believe. They will not change what, they're, what, what they believe. And you may be asking yourselves, why? Like, what, why would that happen? We'll go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And you may be saying in your, in your heart, you know, oh, I feel so bad. It makes me want to cry for this person or I, I, I love this person so much. And I'm just, I'm dying to get this person saved. And the, the thing that I think is back to a story in 1 um, in first, in first Samuel when God, when um, so, King Saul 
doesn't listen to the Lord when he's, he's, he's going to war. And, you know, the Lord tells him, go destroy this whole city. Don't leave anything. Kill everything. You, you know, even the, even the livestock. Get rid of all of it. And he doesn't do that. He does, it, he does what, he own, he, what he wants. He, he takes some of the livestock for himself so he can sacrifice it and so he can eat it. He takes some of the gold and the silver and he keeps the king alive. And he doesn't listen. And God rejects Saul for being king. And Samuel starts to cry, and you know he's weeping about it, and he feels very sad about it. And, and the Lord looks at Samuel and says, how long are you going to weep for this, this king that I have rejected? Sometimes as humans, we want to feel bad for people because we feel like there's no other, like they just don't know, or they just, and God understands that, no, 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 it's not that they don't know, it's that they decided not to do what's right. So in our hearts, we think, oh, no, the, if I could just change their thought on this or... But in God's eyes, he's saying, no, it's not that they don't know. It's not that they, you're, you're not giving or you're not doing something right or you're not giving it to the... It's that they have chosen in their heart, no matter how they say it to you or no, no matter how they flip it and twist, they have chosen in their heart to do what they want. And sometimes that's hard to accept. But God kind of, as a good father, kind of like makes us deal with these situations. If you ever read the Old Testament and they go, start going through the book of Numbers and Leviticus and they start talking about the punishments that people receive, let's say somebody is about to receive a death sentence, right? If you see somebody, let's say like there's two of you together and you saw somebody kill someone else, you two who saw it would be two witnesses, right? Because uh, God says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses will everything be established. So if somebody just said, hey, I saw that person kill someone, that doesn't count because it could just be their word against their word. You have to have two. So you two that see it, the Bible says that you two are the first two people to stone that person. And it says, feel no mercy for them. Because in their heart, they have chosen to do that action. And God wants us to be able to side with him, to love his word so much, to love him so much that we can feel that type of emotion towards someone else in the sense that you have wronged God. And sometimes we don't think like that. We just think about that person. Like we're just like, oh, this person's, but they're so good in everything else that they do. They're so kind and sweet and charitable and they like give cookies to the homeless. But in God's eyes, they hate and reject Jesus. So who do you love more, that person or God? Often it's a test of faith for the Lord. So he wants you to be able to see you with your whole heart gave, told that person about Jesus. And they said, in the, in, they may have not spoken it out loud, but to God, they said, I don't care about Jesus. I don't care that he came to earth and died for me. I don't care that he had to believe. And that makes God angry. And it should make you angry, but sometimes we don't see it like that. We kind of see it from our own lens, but I love this person so much. You have to, that's why Jesus says, if you come to me and you don't hate your father, your mother, your parents, because you have to love God so much that everybody else you can, you, you, you can deal with in like a, a non... Um, What's that word? It, 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 you don't respect the, their person. I don't mean you don't respect them as a person. I mean, you're not partial to anyone. You love the Lord so much that you don't become partial to people based on your relationship with them. You just put God above it. So Ephesians 4, verse 17, it says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. So notice it says it's all in their, it's, it's their desire to be darkened from the light of God. 
They don't want any light to shed on their, because then they'll have to do something about it, right? They'll have to believe and they'll have to, they'll have to admit that they've done something. Because you can't believe in Jesus if you think you've never done any wrong. Because would, there would be no reason to believe in Jesus. So, some people will just never believe. They don't want to. They don't want to have to say that, oh, I've done something wrong. I do need a Savior. Now let's go to Luke 16. It says in verse 19, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. That means he lived well, he lived delicately. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that, in the, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And you have to realize that this person is a great, 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 great grandchild of Abraham. So Abraham would love him no matter how he was, right? Like if you, you, if you can think about this in, 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 a, in a very long context, it, you know, imagine your daughter had a daughter who had a daughter who had a, and, and it goes down the line. You would think that that's your blood. You know, you love that person. And Abraham doesn't say, I love you. I feel so bad for you. Notice what he says. He says, son, remember in that, notice how he calls him son. He's, you know, he's, he's speaking to one of his direct descendants. He literally is. Remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus his evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, so this is the, the rich man speaking in hell. He said, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So the rich man's saying to Abraham, all right, I understand. You're not going to give me a little, and notice how bad hell is, right? You're not going to even give me a little, a little dip of water on my tongue. But can you please just send Lazarus back from the grave and send him to my father's house so that my brothers can at least believe? You know, if you raised Lazarus from the grave, they're all going to believe that Jesus is, is God. Or that, you know, believe in God in general, because this was, this, Jesus is speaking in the context before he was here. <clears throat> and it says in verse uh, 28, I'm um, sorry, verse 29, And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one will go unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Do you understand what that's saying? Is Abraham is explaining the fact that if somebody won't hear the simple gospel that you give them, you know, what, what did Moses and the prophets say? just kept saying, believe in God, believe in God, everything that they did, have faith in God. If they can't just believe that, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what verse you give them. You know, if you, if you go to give somebody the gospel and they completely reject you, and I know it's harder when you actually know the person and you actually have a, a tie with the person. It doesn't matter. You, you, you may beat yourself up like, oh, I should have gave them this verse or I should have said this a little bit differently. It doesn't matter what you would have said. You could raise somebody from the grave next to them and they still wouldn't believe. That's what Abraham's trying to explain. He's trying to explain to us that if they are not willing to receive the gospel, it does not matter what you do. They're still not going to believe. 
So if you're ever trying to give the gospel, and I know I, I receive emails about this all the time because people want their, their husband saved or their wife saved or their grandmother saved or whatever. And they'll be like, oh, I just, I, I just, I should have, made, do you have a, a better verse? I use these verses and they're all perfect. But, you know, it says that Jesus died for their sins. That's all they need. And they're like, oh, maybe there's a better verse that I'm not, and I, I hate to tell them, but I tell them every time and I send, I send this exact verse. If they are not willing to believe, there's no other verse you could have showed them that would have made them believe in that moment. I'm not saying somebody will never get saved because obviously there's people like I was given the gospel when I was young and I didn't believe it. I'm not saying nobody can, will ever get saved. I'm just saying in that moment, you give somebody the gospel, they reject it, it's not their time. It may never be their time. I'm trying to also explain that it may never be their time. They may never believe, or they may believe later. But you just, you did your part. That's it. That's where you end it. Either they'll come to you, or another opportunity way in the future will present itself. But not every, you start berating them every single day, with you're going to harden their heart even more. Even more, and I'll show you some, I'll show you some um, examples of that. Let's go to Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. Exodus 9, verse 23, it says, And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran along uh, upon the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail smote through all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and, and the hail smote every herb of the field, and break every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron, and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough, that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord. And the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how, that there is, that how the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. And the flax and the barley were smitten, and the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bold. And the wheat and the, the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. And Moses went out, to the city, out of the city from Pharaoh, and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart and his servants. So notice... It doesn't matter how many miracles that God shows Pharaoh and his servants. It's not just Pharaoh. It's his servants, too. It's everybody. It doesn't matter how many miracles God does in front of them. Lice, turning water to blood, frogs all over, locusts eating everything that they own. It doesn't matter how many miracles... Moses shows these people from the Lord. Every time they st stop, they, they stop, they don't believe. They harden their hearts immediately. So you can give somebody the gospel, and if they reject it, there's nothing that you can do. There's not another verse you can give them, a miracle you can show them. It doesn't matter. Their hearts are hardened towards God. And until something changes, you need to stop worrying about it. You did your part. You did everything that you could do. Look at Mark chapter 6. Mark 
Let's read verse 11. It says, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tol tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So notice, Sodom and Gomorrah, which was one of the most wicked nations to ever exist, so wicked that God himself, Jesus, came down to earth and looked at it and burned it with fire. Fire and brimstone rained down from heaven and burned. He's saying it would be, it's better for Sodom, they're going to have a, a, a less of a punishment than the people you give the gospel to. That's how wicked that God thinks their heart is for rejecting Jesus. That's a very, very serious accusation to say that Jesus didn't die for their sins. And, but also notice, if you give somebody the gospel, he says, whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you leave, shake off the dust of your feet. He doesn't say, stay there, and I'll give you some different words to say, and we'll try this, and we'll get you a bulletin point, and you can start laying stuff out on the board, and maybe if you... No, he says, after you try and give them the gospel, if they don't hear you, leave that city and shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. What he's saying is, don't let any... In another verse it says, doesn't, don't even let it cleave unto you. And what he's saying is, Leave everything of that city behind. Stop worrying about it. It doesn't matter how close you are to somebody. It doesn't matter how much you think or wonderful this person. If, you're give, if they're rejecting God, you need to just say, okay, I, I, I cannot... No, I, it doesn't mean like we have to hate people or like, you know, and if you're working with, if you give somebody the gospel you're working with and they reject it, it doesn't mean you have to quit your job. What I'm saying is you have to be like, they have to be to you as a heathen. You know, you, you can't be spending all your time with them, like your, your free time. I don't mean like if you have to be with somebody, that's totally different. But that person is a rejecter of Jesus. You have to shake the dust off your feet and not let it cleave to you. You can't, you can't as, be as close as you were to that person. They're no longer your spirit. They're no longer somebody that you can associate with because they, they not only, they not only are unsafe, they have now rejected the gospel. Before, you don't even know if they've heard it before. But if you try and get somebody saved, like let's say you're spending time with a, a, a friend or a family member a lot, and you know, you're trying to get them saved and they're just not believe, that person that you have given the gospel to is now worse off than Sodom and Gomorrah. So to God, it's worse to hear the gospel and reject it than to just be a regular sinner in the world. And nobody's going to really have an excuse. Like, you can go to anybody pretty much in America and just ask them, have you ever heard of Jesus? And they'll say yes. You can go to anyone pretty much in the world, and I, I can say that honestly, 90 to 95% of the world, and say, have you ever heard of Jesus? And they'll say yes. So nobody's going to have an excuse. But all I'm trying to say is don't let it bother you and realize how deep of a repercussion this is. You know, you, you, you have to choose who you are siding with. you side with the Lord or do you side with this person that you've known for so long and you just they're such a good person you just want to get them saved? All right, now let's go to um, Hebrews 4. Just a couple more verses, Hebrews 4. So with all this information, does it mean we shouldn't even try and give the gospel? And the answer is no, of course you should try and get everybody saved. Always tell anybody that you know, that, you're, that you see, that you have to spend time with about Jesus. Do your best to give them the gospel one time. You know, do, do whatever you can to just tell them about Jesus. Because if you look at verse 12 in Hebrews 4, it says, 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you give somebody the gospel and you give them what is the word of God, that's where, the, well, that's where you get the gospel from, it can change someone. It, 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 even the, the most unreachable person you think, like they could be the hardest person you know, you can give them some Bible verse, it could, it could pierce right through all that. All their rejection of everything else in the world, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what type of person they are. It just, it just matters that you try and pierce them with the Word of God. It, just because you know that it, they might reject it, doesn't mean that you don't give it a chance. Because the Word of God is so powerful, it can, be, it can, it can cut through anything. Imagine in order to get somebody saved, you have to take a sword and just like cut through iron, right? You know, just like a, a big beam, a big iron beam. And you have to take a sword and just, the only way somebody's gonna get saved, you cut through it. The word of God is like hot diamond metal. It can just cut through anything. So give it a chance. Give the gospel to anybody you think needs to get saved. But just keep in mind that it, it's not your fault if they reject it. And last verse, uh, John chapter 12. Even Paul believed. You know, he, he says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, For I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He says he's the least of all apostles. He hated Jesus so much. And he persecuted every single Christian. He was killing apostles himself, you know, by delivering them to death. And Paul was changed. So it can change anybody. And go to John chapter 12, verse 48. It says in verse 48, <clears throat> He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. It is your job to give Jesus' word to anybody. It, you have no idea if they'll receive it or not. And at least if you give it to somebody and they reject it, they can never say they didn't truly know. Because God knows that they know. And if you go to somebody and they're not saved and they, you did your best, you gave them the gospel, you told them about Jesus. And if they don't believe, that's completely on them. In the last day, they'll have to say, God will bring it to their remembrance. They're at the judgment seat of Christ and Jesus is there and he's saying, hey, I sent this person, blank, you know, and they told you about me. And you chose not to believe. That's your only job. And that's all you have to do. But just keep in mind, like I said, you can't get upset if somebody doesn't believe. It's not what you're saying. It's not the verse you're not giving. It's not, if I came and gave them the gospel, they'd definitely get saved. I've had people tell me that too. Like, oh, I've tried to give the gospel to my, you know, eight-year-old daughter and um, she just won't believe. But I know if, if you as a pastor would call her, she would 100% believe because you know so many Bible verses. And every time I say, nope, if they won't believe you, they're not going to believe me. It's the same exact gospel. We don't believe anything different. So that's it. I'll close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for your word. Thank you for teaching us these things and giving us all this information, Lord, so that we may be at peace and so that we may know what is your will for us, Lord. Thank you for always guiding us, Lord, and helping us to be strong and bold to give the gospel. And please open the hearts of many so that they may hear and believe. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.